floor. My name is Lucy Zoria and I'm the program manager here at America House Studio. Outside summer is blooming and so we are continuing our green summer campaign at America House. Today our session will be led by our very own America House volunteer Kalina Rondak. Some of you may already know Kalina from her fantastic TED English session that she's done with us and also for, from the very fun video in which she taught our Tatiana Strachinka, our director of America House Kiev, how to make American hot dogs. We're very excited to have Kalina and this very interesting session that she has prepared for us today. With her is a special guest that she will be introducing shortly. And as for the subject, art is not something just for entertainment. It could also be a powerful medium through which to communicate very important ideas. And today we'll be talking about art and ecological awareness. So please welcome Kalina and her special guest and have a great evening. Thank you, Lucy. Hi, everyone. I'm Kalina and I'm here in Ola Rondiak's art studio here in Kiev, Ukraine joined by the very own Ola Rondiak, my lovely mother, an internationally renowned artist. And would you like to introduce yourself, maybe say a few words about who you are and what your art means? Okay, thank you, Kalina. Thank you so much to America House for having me here today. Uh, it's really special and it's an honor. Uh, my name is Ola Rondiak. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a Ukrainian-American artist, meaning I, I grew up in America. I was the daughter of Ukrainian immigrants who immigrated from Ukraine to America after World War II. Um, I grew up uh, with a Ukrainian, very strong Ukrainian identity. I went to Ukrainian school every Saturday, Ukrainian camps in the summertime. So it was always something very important to me. And luckily I found a partner who felt the same about Ukraine. And shortly after we got married, when Ukraine became independent over 25 years ago, uh, we decided to move to Ukraine. And Ukraine has been um, a well of inspiration for me. And we've been mostly, I've been here ever, ever since. And yeah, raised three beautiful children here and um, then discovered myself as an artist. By, by profession, I was a social worker and then a psychotherapist. And then in the process of motherhood, I discovered myself as an artist. So right around 2013, um, right before um, the second revolution began in 20, winter of 2013, I, I started giving art my full-time attention as a full-time job. And so I've, I haven't looked back since. And I've been really lucky to uh, exhibit in many interesting countries and museums and galleries across the world. So it's really an, a pleasure to share some of my experience with you today. Thank you for being here. Great, so moving towards our main focus, of this eco art talk. 
a little bit about the Multimedia Eco Project that Ola participated in last year entitled Who If Not You? Would you like to say a few words on that? Sure. Um, the title, as you said, is Who If Not You? It was a multimedia um, eco art project. It was organized by Culture Trend Magazine and it was held here in CAVE at Ornament Art Space. And the curator's name is Victoria Stepanets. I hope you're joining us today, Victoria. Um, she had invited me to participate in an exhibition entitled Genesis that was held in Prague in 2019. So she had already been familiar with my work. And so she invited me to be part of this project in Kyiv in 2020. And what sort of sparked your interest to be in this project? Um, well, I mean, initially, you know, uh, Victoria was the curator and she had already been familiar with my work. Uh, she knew about my clothing sculptures and these clothing sculptures um, have been traveling and taking on different forms uh, in several exhibits since 2019. Um, they first started here in Gallery 83 and an exhibit called Evolution and Resemblance and which where we had uh, the Maltankas sort of floating in the air and then the clothing pieces on the ground. And it was sort of in Ukraine at that time, it took on sort of a feeling of this clothing being scattered around as if left. Um, there were a lot of refugees at, at that time. So it sort of got, gave this feeling of, of things that were left behind. And then uh, a curator by the name of Juan Puntes, the um, director of, Col of White Box Art Center in New York City, uh, invited me to do an exhibit there as well. And we did a similar setup. Uh, it's sort of the whole, uh, the name of the exhibit changed to Metempsychosis, where we also had the Maltankas in the air, but they they gave the feeling in, in that space, um, it became like the Maltankas were reminding us of our ancestries and they were floating as this sort of spiritual beings. And the clothing on the ground took on another meaning, a meaning um, a little more like, um, like the, the transgression of time and how we see that time moves forward and a representation of the children's clothing as like uh, onto better times. So I think it's fascinating how um, similar objects can, can take on different meanings depending on the curation, which is really special. So uh, that's what happened here for this eco project. Um, Victoria and I brainstormed for a little bit on how we can uh, create, how I can make these clothing uh, sculptures relevant to an eco theme. And also my artwork uh, does focus a lot on the themes of responsibility and freedom and identity. So in that sense, it was a really good fit and they entered, you know, it, it worked together very well. Great, so let's start with this piece right in between us here, this lovely pants sculpture. Would you like to dive a little deeper into some of the materials you used, why you use them, and some of the choices you made for this piece? Sure, um, like the clothing, it, it, clothing itself can take on this feeling of freedom if we use it to express ourselves, uh, which is one of the reasons I love fashion design. Um, and on the other hand, clothing can also feel a little bit restrictive and um, keep us uh, from moving freely. So by using pants, I wanted to exaggerate this feeling of restriction um, uh, it started with paper mache and fabric and then uh, plaster of Paris is what makes it hard. And then I chose to use wire and rope to wrap around the legs to, again, exaggerate this feeling of, of restriction and being uncomfortable to bring awareness to the unfairness that happens in our ecology. Yeah, so unfortunately, a few of the pieces that you participated in this project with could not be here with us today. We have four lovely pieces with us. And then a couple of the pieces we weren't able to have with us are a dress sculpture and also a very large motanka. 
So if we, I think we do have the pictures here on a slide for you guys to be able to still see these installations, great. And would you like to dive a little deeper into these pieces and specifically how you transformed this Ukrainian symbol of a motanka into being about eco-awareness and things like that? Okay, um, so you can see the dress sculpture, um, the image, it's similar to the pants. Um, I often, uh, with my pieces, is I often try to have it be like, from a distance, it looks interesting and um, attractive. It makes you want to, you know, aesthetically pleasing to come up and look at it closer. And then as you get closer, you know, specifically with the collage and the use of materials, you can start seeing the meaning uh, behind the sculpture. So here you can see that I used a fence as the corset on the dress. And if you get closer, you can see that um, the collages are of animals being mistreated. And so this, again, similar to the pants, gives you this feeling of restriction. The fence is like a cage. And, you know, just as it, it can be thought about as a corset, which was restrictive to females maybe many years ago, um, in this particular piece, it sort of juxtaposes all these different meanings um, behind it. And you can see images of animals being mistreated. And then moving on to the Maltenka, the Maltenka has for several years been a strong sculptural a piece for me, part of my sculptural repertoire. It's inspired for me by the ancient Ukrainian rag doll called the Maltenka. And this Maltenka is used to be given, passed down from mothers to daughters as a talisman for good, good luck, good faith, good fortune, good health. And so when the war broke out in 2014, I decided to, um, uh, the, the Motonka became very integral and important to me as this protectress for Ukraine. And so I also decided to use the material of plaster to make them large. And because plaster is the material we use to heal broken bones. So along with the feeling of protection, it added this element of healing. So for this eco project, I mean, I thought of uh, very often when I drive by my house here, there's woods that have a lot of garbage in it, which always makes me sad. And the Maltenka for me um, was an, a, an easy transition as a protectress and healing to also symbolize Mother Earth. So by gathering the garbage, Kalina happened to be here that summer as well and gathered garbage with me in the woods. And it became this actually very sad process to sort of like this beautiful feeling of this Motonka, like almost like a goddess, a bohemia. And I was gluing and stapling and collaging all this garbage on top of it, which was that same feeling of seeing the garbage in the woods. So that's the title of the, this Motonka is Please Forgive Us uh, in reference to um, the garbage that we place on mother nature and to bring an awareness to our own be daily behavior. That's really interesting how you connected the historical Ukrainian themes with the very present and current um, societal issues such as eco-awareness. And yes. a little bit more on that, was it difficult to sort of make this switch from Ukraine being your main source of inspiration to doing more present issues such as eco-awareness today? Um, it, it was a little bit, you know, at first it took a little while for me to think about it and brainstorm with the curator. Um, it's always important for me to keep my voice. Um, so I, I get a little hesitant at first with the new propositions and because I don't want to lose my voice. But what I've learned is that you know, a lot of these themes are so universal. And so by adding another dimension, another perspective, I think it only, you know, it, it gives it, it makes it that much more interesting. And also a lot of my work, like I said earlier, um, focuses on themes of responsibility and freedom. So honestly, it became a really good fit. Great. Um, 
So going more into art in general and its influence on these societal issues, what impact do you think art can have on things like eco-awareness and, and maybe not only trying to fix the problem, but just raising awareness about these environmental issues and maybe even other societal issues that we face? Yeah, I definitely see art as a vehicle uh, for social change. I think it's really important that it stays in top priority in the culture because um, it not only increases communication between individuals, which is very important in and of itself, but it also increases communication between different cultures and brings on a new level of understanding. Um, it brings up questions, which sometimes lends people to change their opinions when they see things from another perspective. It's definitely a very effective cultural tool. And um, I think it exposes a lot of issues and feelings sometimes that, um, I mean, it reflects a lot of, art can reflect a lot of societal concerns. So I think it's really important. <laughs> um, because for the for these reasons, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Or, or did I answer it already? No, I think you totally answered it. That okay, was exactly what I was looking for. Um, and speaking to this relationship between art and the environment, where do you see the art world moving towards in the future with more of these societal issues as they're sure to come? Um. Well, I think uh, art often reflects a lot of our societal concerns. So as long as we neglect our responsibility as humans um, with nature and our ecological issues, then it's certain to be uh, reflected in art to help continue to bring awareness. Um, I think, you know, as I said, I think it should all, always play a vital role in our culture. It does uh, a lot of great things. It gives voice voices to people who can't uh, have a voice about certain issues, about feelings. It forces us to look outside of ourselves and address responsibilities that we might be neglecting. Um, it reminds us to make conscious decisions on a daily level. Um, in my work, for example, I also try to preserve a sense of history my work has sometimes been described as contemporary art with a historical conscience. Um, like for example, um, with art being able to give a voice to um, emotions or cultures that have gone through certain suffering or inability to speak for themselves. Um, you know, like for example, I use it in my artwork um, when I first started doing contemporary icon collages, which was inspired by my grandmother's unfinished icon, which she created, she embroidered when she was in a Soviet labor camp after the war. And she was secretly uh, creating these embroideries. And when she was released from there, she smuggled uh, these embroideries into her clothes, went back to Western Ukraine and was able to give them to a clandestine priest who traveled with these embroideries to America. And, and he ended up in Chicago. And so the Chicago Tribune in 1980 did a, a big spread on it from Soviet prisons with love because there were also um, many, many women that were making these embroideries in hope um, for their own survival and hope to connect with their families one day. And so the strength that we can gather from that is really immeasurable. I mean, I, like I said, I have a well of inspiration forever and I've never even met this, my grandmother and my mother, unfortunately never saw her from age 11. They were separated. So the amount of uh, strength and hope that she was able to deliver from her embroideries to inspire a whole nother generation is just mind blowing. That's the power of art. Yeah, I agree. Um, so shifting to a little more of a personal lens, what do you, Ola Rondiak, have coming up in your future works and exhibits and what can we look forward to supporting from you? 
Um, right now, I'm heavily focused on my straight jackets, which are also on the theme of freedom and responsibility because straight jackets um, were used to restrain people. The arms get you know tied around so the person, you know, on, on one hand, it was used for comforting purposes so that somebody can't um, do harm to themselves or others. On the other side, it's sort of symbolic for me um, of how sometimes we restrict ourselves from our own freedoms and opportunities. So in that sense, uh, for that reason, I chose to cut off the arms on the straight jacket and flip it around to give a sense of freedom. And um, yeah, so that's what I'm focusing on. Uh, working on doing a collaboration with Fozianov, fashion designer, famous fashion designer here in Kiev, hopefully by the end of the summer. So uh, you'll see that posted on my website, Facebook, Instagram. And then of course, preparing for our Miami week, first week of December, I'm very excited about that. And that's also gonna have a strong focus on my straight jackets this year. Great, so that is all the questions we have prepared today, but we already have one question from the audience. And if you guys like, we could open the floor to a Q&A session and you can drop any questions that you have for Ola in the comments and we'll get to them. So first question is from Bukhdana. She says, hi Ola, if you could dedicate a piece of art to only one environmental issue, what would it be? Oh, wow. One environmental issue, what would it be? I mean, I think I just really, uh, I guess my easy answer is um, just mother nature and the Maltenka because the Maltenka is such a powerful figure for me in terms of, of nurturing and protection and healing as is mother nature. So I think that, that that would be it because it just encompasses so much for me and it allows for people to relate to it in their own way. Great. So maybe while we're waiting for a few more questions, we can dive into some different pieces of art. For example, this jacket we have behind mm -hmm. us. You want to talk about this? Okay. Yeah, this was also, of course, part of uh, the same exhibit. It's titled, Who Died for Your Coat? So again, from a distance, it just looks like a trendy, cool jacket in, a, in the form of a sculpture. And as you get close, you start feeling the discomfort because <laughs> you read the words. And um, on the sleeves are cages uh, with little cute rabbits inside. And there's like, um, uh, what is it called? Barbed the, the barbed wire around the neck. So it's all symbolic for this feeling of uh, being mistreated and just sort of a reflection on us as, as humans, just to make sure that our vanity doesn't get the best of us sometimes and to remember uh, nature, where we come from and how to treat our uh, entire ecological system, including our beautiful little furry friend. And I'm curious, do you think that um, as you mentioned, maybe moving closer to the fashion world in the future with your straight jackets and things like that. And obviously these aren't wearable fashion pieces, but they sort of do encapsul encapsulate that clothing feeling, even mm -hmm. though they're sculptures. Do you think um, you'll find yourself making fashion with similar themes as your sculptures have? Just maybe not as dramatic in the way they're portrayed? Um, very possible, very possible. I've, I'm really enjoying the process that I'm doing with the straight jackets now in terms of um, creating them as art pieces. And I'm, I'm also creating a couple sculpture, sculpture pieces involving the straight jackets and then to be able to also turn it around and actually use it as a trendy um, fashion statement and a voice for freedom and bringing social awareness um, socially to a lot of social injustices around the world and in all different cultures. Um, so I love that whole, that whole mix and um, transitioning mm -hmm. from one form to another. So I think that's very possible. You think that wearable fashion has a similar effect and impact that 
um, physical, like fine art might have on societal issues? Most definitely. And um, that's one of the reasons I love it so much also, because in some ways it reaches even that many more people because if it's something that you're just wearing on the street, you have more eyes on it, more people see it and um, yeah, and ask questions about it and it brings more awareness that way. I think it's great to put the, the galleries on the streets as well. Yeah, I think we're seeing that more and more with mm -hmm. new um, small brands in fashion. They're trying to bring these types of societal changes with their- Yeah, it's work. beautiful. Yeah. So we have one more question from the audience from Gennady or Genity. Uh, Dear Ola, why are your pieces of art colored mainly in black and white? I think referring to this project in hmm. particular. <laughs> Interesting question. <laughs> that was probably subconsciously done. Um, I think that it, it just happens to be very, um, strong in this group in this these this group of pieces i think um it's also because i love i really have a love for these colors also going back to ancient ukraine and the tripillion culture this sort of black white off-white maroon these this earthy terracotta feeling so i think that it was natural for me to turn to these colors for an an eco project there are a lot of color, there's a lot of color in the Motsanka though also. <laughs> Great, so should we keep going maybe with um, either your painting or the Motsanka behind us, which everyone you'd like to sort For of dive into? Sure, I mean, into. these were also on the same theme, the theme of um, responsibility, freedom. So you'll see on this Motsanka, it's about freedom, svoboda, svoboda is the word for freedom. Uh, it's a shtrodnya which means every day, every day we make choices uh, that make us responsible for the next day. Um, and the same uh, with the painting, it was just all done in the same theme and the same vein um, for this project, focusing on the responsibility of our freedoms because we often you know, forget that with freedom comes a very big responsibility. It's not like we can go, oh, you know, my grandmother, uh, suffered in a labor camp and but I'm free so woohoo no <laughs> you know I really strongly believe because I have received this freedom I have a strong responsibility to give voices to past generations um, you know so I see myself as just a vessel um, for giving a voice to those that were not able to have that voice it's very important for us to do that I think yeah, great so another comment from the same audience member, um, when it comes to the environment, the green color usually comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna maybe comment on why you didn't use this as a strong motif in these birds? Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of colors in the Motanka and that's where you'll see a lot of green. I know it probably, maybe it shows up small on your screen so you don't really get the full feeling, but the Motanka is, um, human size in real life so it's large and there's a lot of greenery in there including in the vinok which is the headpiece with the flowers and the leaves so yeah I agree with you green is definitely a strong element mm. so another question from me um, would you like to maybe talk about how your art has evolved over the last decade since starting to take it seriously again and why you think maybe it's evolved in the way that it has? Um, okay. I think that, um, you know, as I, as I grew up, I had a very uh, practical upbringing um, from my Ukrainian immigrant parents. And I think my mom's watching, so thanks mom. I appreciate it because it's allowed me to uh, connect both my, my creative side with my practical side into actually visualizing projects and making them happen because you also have to be very, you know, organized and practical in terms of, of movement with all this stuff. So. I think my evolution, um, you know, it was 
Probably, um, you know, I loved my career as a psychotherapist. It's very interesting to me. And when I started um, having children, I wanted to really be be home uh, to raise you guys. And um, so I was fortunate to be able to do that. And in the process of doing it, it unleashed a lot of create. It started unleashing my creativity. It was really instantaneous um, when I was pregnant with my first child, Kalina's brother. Um, I automatically just created the, made the dining room our studio and just started, you know, transforming furniture into art pieces. And then when we moved to Ukraine the second time, I was really into fashion. So I started uh, doing whatever I could with the hours that I had as a, as a busy mom with three little kids. And so uh, that was, it was a very organic transformation. Um, and then from the fashion, you know, I started using the fabric to create fabric collages. And then moving up into uh, 2013, I just started making um, within like a month or two, I was creating one painting a day, it was just coming out of me of these contemporary female portraits. And a friend came over and saw 50 of these paintings in the room and said, you have to exhibit these. So that's sort of where my first main exhibit happened in 2013. And a lot of other pieces sold, most of the pieces sold, which was very uh, reconfirming for me that I was on the right path. And a lot of those paintings were on paper and even cardboard. So then after that, I, I felt confident to be able to purchase some canvases and paint and paints and, and like it just kept evolving organically that way. And then from one exhibit to the next and then I'm still interested in fashion. So I love that it's being, all being connected and the element of sculpture. I mean, I have so many ideas and visions and things that I, I wanna carry through. So I just hope I have enough time to do most of them. Great. So another question from Cherie. Um, in the US, we hear so much about our rights, but not our responsibilities especially to each other and the earth. How is this approach received in Ukraine? Um, gosh, I'm not sure if I would be able to make such a general uh, statement. I, I like to think that, you know, people are people everywhere and we all need gentle reminders. So I think that, you know, it's, it's being well received and, um, yeah, bringing, bringing awareness to our cultures. And I think, you know, you, you said it perfectly. So that's really important. And I, and I hope that uh, Ukrainians, you know, feel it the same as, as everywhere else <laughs> now. Yeah. Do you see yourself doing a similar project in the future about eco-awareness or maybe a different topic, but sort of a similar theme in mind? Uh, very possible, very possible. I really, um, like I said, my whole style is very uh, intuitive and organic. So I don't like, I, I don't fully plan everything in advance because I like to go with the way, the way it's sort of full. Like I have a lot of ideas in my head, but I feel like all of that has to also go along with the flow with, um, you know, the people that I meet, the next projects that are presented and, um, you know, the things that uh, stay very important to me on my themes of freedom, identity, uh, transgenerational pain, responsibility, individual responsibility. So yeah, I'm, I'm open to it. Yeah, so we have another question. Have you ever been awarded for your creations? <laughs> awarded. Interesting question. Um, I think uh, I get awarded on so many different levels. Um, you know, that's for me the really such a beautiful part of creating art. I mean, I feel like I just get intrinsically awarded just by having the ability um, to to allow myself to create and to let these voices come through me. So I feel 
awarded on a human spiritual level on a daily basis. I get awarded um, by moments like this, being able to share my work and have conversations uh, with people about things that are important to us. I get awarded when somebody wants to purchase a piece of art. Uh, of course, that's always special to me when somebody wants to um, you know, trade their hard earned money for something that I've created that speaks to them. That's always very humbling and special. Um, so yeah, I think the awards come on so many different levels. Yeah, um, a question from me again. Is there a moment in your art career that sort of stands out as maybe pivotal or just sort of a time when you recognize like, wow, like this is for real, I'm an artist. Um, I've maybe like earned my spot in the art world or I'm going to continue um, seriously investing in myself as an artist since you um, started sort of post motherhood? Yeah, great question, Kalina. <laughs> I think um, it's probably, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question for you to pose because you've sort of been observing it in, at home and watching me evolve as an artist. And so um, as it's transpired again, I really have to answer that honestly, just to say that it's been very organic. There's been many steps. Uh, there, there was not one pivotal moment, but many, many different pivotal moments and, and people that I've met along the way, people who have supported in me and believed in me and um, helped me, you know, introduce me to new people to take the next step. Um, and it's just, it's all just been such an honor and a beautiful evolution and yeah, I mean, again, with my practical upbringing, all of this has been in steps. It wasn't like, um, you know, that I would just, oh, I'm going to invest X amount of money. I felt like from the very beginning that I would always try to only use the money that I, I kind of treated it as a little business in that sense. And to, to and I think that just for the purpose also to keep me grounded and understand if there's a value of this and if it's if what I'm creating is actually resonating with other people, or if I'm in my own little la la land, <laughs> which is okay too sometimes. Um, but yeah, I think that all those steps, so I tried to, um, you know, keep whatever I earned through my art, I would reinvest again in more materials into another project or to be able to travel to another exhibit. And yeah, there comes a time. There comes a time where sometimes you just have to. I mean, I at this point in time, I guess I'll own what I'm saying. I believe uh, in myself as an artist now, and I feel the confidence, and I'm super excited. And although, um, uh, you know, to you or to some people, I may be middle aged. Uh, <laughs> in in terms of myself as an artist, I feel very young and excited and energetic because it's like it's still fresh and new, and I'm very excited about it. And I'm always like, I can't wait to get to work. You know, I love to have fun, and I love family time, and I love being with friends, and I also the same way like love to get back to work. Yeah. So sort of in that same vein of discovering yourself as an artist, do you have any pieces of advice for maybe younger people who um, aren't sure if they're an artist maybe, or think that they are an artist, but are struggling to sort of find their path in the world, whether it's choosing to go to school for art or branch out independently? Do you have any words for them? Yeah, I think it's difficult to give kind of general advice because I think it's really on an individual basis. Um, probably if you're thinking you're an artist, you probably are. <laughs> it, it, um, but there's, uh, I know art, you can be an artist on so many different levels. I mean, you know, for me, my art journey um was was kind of slow and I didn't discover myself as an artist until later in life because you know for practical reasons I needed to get a job I needed to make money 
um, and support myself. Um, and so, and, and I just also just didn't realize it that strongly at that time. That was just an evolution for me. And that was my journey. And that was the way it was supposed to be for me. So I think it's really different for everybody. I mean, there are people who get discovered at, in various forms of art, you know, from 12 years old and their career takes off when they're 15. Um, I think everyone just has their own path. So I guess the, the strongest piece of advice, which is for artists, for any career choice, is to just really try to listen um, to yourself, to, to where you feel you should be, pay attention to what you're good at, and try to align those things together as much as possible. Do you see um, the world creating sort of this new generation of more and more artists than maybe we've seen in the past generation? Or do you think this isn't the case and maybe it's just being more brought to light than it was in the past? I think, uh, I, I don't know like about the statistics, actual numbers, honestly, but I do think that art is, um, I guess you could say becoming more universal or more, um, more, um, more, um, how do I say it? Like accessible, accessible. more accessible in, in you know many people's homes, not just you know accessible to people who have money to go to the opera or to go to a museum. Like it's becoming more and more accessible with the help of street art, with the help of incorporating art. I think art's getting. Um, we're realizing how important art and culture are, and. I think the actual like combination of all these strengths, these powers like technology and in, in industry, uh, science, art, and to put all these like amazing, important disciplines to connect them, I think just, just makes us all that much more powerful. Mm -hmm. And do you think that social media plays a critical role in this emergence of maybe a new art wave or do you think that hasn't come yet do you see um sort of new trends in art maybe especially um emerging from this past year of a global pandemic and everything being virtual virtual exhibits and maybe virtual galleries and things like that how do you see the impact of um, the online universe into the, into the art world? Yeah, for sure. I mean, social media uh, definitely plays a huge role. Back to accessibility, right? Like now you can have a culture on your computer at home. You know, now is that the same feeling as going to the museum or a gallery and seeing the piece up front? No. I would argue no, but it's still, um, it still gives us an awareness that it's out there. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I think this, the, the pandemic, this, this feeling of, of lockdown and getting more into doing things online, it also comes back to this theme of responsibility again. I mean, who creates social media? We do. So I think it's really important that you know, everybody who plays a role on social media asks themselves the question, am I making the world a better place with what I'm putting out there or not? Because, you know, that that all contributes to our culture. So I think it's important to be aware of that and take responsibility for what we put out there. Which connects back to who, if not you. Exactly. The multimedia eco project that we've been discussing. Absolutely. Do you see similar trends with social media impacting um, societal issues, such as environmental ones that we were discussing. I'm sorry, earlier. say that again. Like social yeah. media's impact on environmental issues. Um, is it, you're saying, is it beneficial? Like, is it similar to um, social media's impact into the art world? Well, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, 
honestly, you know, uh, yeah, I, I hope so. Just through sheer awareness and the ability to spread the word and communicate and bring up questions and allow people to do things in their own communities that helps. I mean, every single step is important. So it doesn't need to be some kind of extravagant show. Everything you do in your community, I mean, look how great we feel when we go clean up the woods by our house, right? And people recognize that and it's contagious. We have people walk by and say, thank you for doing what you're doing. And we've seen it be cleaner mm -hmm. since. So I think we just all have a role in that. Yeah, great. Well, if there's no more questions from the audience, do you have any closing remarks to sort of wrap up this wonderful art talk? Well, I, again, I would like to express my gratitude to you, my daughter and wonderful interviewer and to America House for this invitation oh, and this possibility. We have a last question. Okay. Um, do you have any piece of art dedicated to the war in Donbass? I have uh, a lot of art dedicated to the war um, in Eastern Ukraine. Um, I've got a lot of uh, collages. Um, I've, I've used a lot of, of my contemporary female portrait collages where um, there's sort of this um, serious, motivated, determined look on these women's faces and then in the Vinox, a lot of times I place collages of images from the war. Um, I use, um, I, um, when the war first started, I gathered all newspapers and magazines and m many um, journals and magazines and things about the war and I um, used that use them as collages in many, many of my pieces. Yeah, that, that, that's been a strong theme for me in a lot of my pieces in my Malton clothes and my, um, and on canvas. Yeah. All right. I wow. hope to bring, uh, you know, awareness um, to, to the world about the war and about Ukraine and hoping that uh, Ukraine can remain uh, free and sovereign and continue its road to the, um, you know, the, the beautiful country that it is. <laughs> Definitely. So wow. we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Ola, for joining America House on their Green Summer campaign. And we look forward to seeing you at our events in the future. And yeah, I had a great time. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Slava Ukraini. Heroin Slava. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.